Welcome to Module 5.1 Video 2. In this video we're going to be talking about the process of DNA replication and how errors in replication are repaired. So, like we alluded to in the video previously, DNA is a template for its own duplication. Because we know that T's always bind to A's and G's always bind to C's, if we break our DNA molecule in half, we can replace the other half of that DNA molecule with this knowledge. So the way DNA is replicated, strands are separated. Each half of the strand determines the sequence of nucleotides in its complementary strand. So complementary strand means the strand that is being newly synthesized. So we have a G, we know the complement is a C, so that'll be the complementary strand, and that's made. So each new double helix contains one of our original strands and one newly synthesized strand. This idea is called semi-conservative replication of DNA. Here in gray you see an original DNA strand. That DNA is split open, so half of that DNA strand goes here and half goes here, and then the blue DNA strand is the newly synthesized strand. So this is why we call it semi-conservative, because each daughter DNA double helix, so this is a daughter DNA double helix, is composed of one conserved strand and one newly synthesized strand. This means that the original strands remain intact for many generations. So how is DNA replicated? Well, the process starts by the DNA double helix being separated. So there are a large number of hydrogen bonds between the bases in DNA. These bonds need to be broken. The first thing that happens is initiator proteins bind and pry the two strands apart. So here's our double-stranded DNA. Then we have the hydrogen bonds being broken. So instead of double-stranded DNA, we have two single-stranded half-DNA molecules, if you will. These um, uh, double-stranded DNAs are then separated by helicase. That's this protein here. Helicase moves along the DNA molecule, separating the double strands into single strands. Then we have something called single-stranded binding proteins that bind to those single strands and prevent them from coming back together into a double strand. So we have an enzyme called DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase reads the single strand of DNA and creates the, uh, brings in the complementary strand and synthesizes that new complementary daughter DNA strand. But DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase can't start DNA chains de novo. De novo is a term that means out of nothing. It actually needs a free three prime hydroxyl end on a pentose sugar. So what happens is we have a, a uh, protein called DNA primase. It gives us a short RNA fragment, about 10 nucleotides, and then our protein called DNA polymerase comes in, uh, and this guy uses the primer to synthesize the daughter DNA strand. You can see that occurring here, DNA polymerase making the daughter DNA strand. So on the leading strand, DNA is synthesized contigu continuously. In other words, DNA polymerase just keeps moving down the DNA as helicase keeps unwinding it, and it continuously adds nucleotides, creating that new double-stranded DNA. However, on the other strand, called the lagging strand, DNA is synthesized discontinuously. We'll talk more about this in the next couple of slides. So after DNA polymerase 3 has done its thing, we have another mo molecule called DNA polymerase 1. That comes in and replaces that short 10 nucleotide primer we talked about with DNA. And then we have a molecule called DNA ligase that seals the gaps between our discontinually synthesized lagging strand fragments. These are called Okazaki fragments. And that joins those Okazaki fragments into one uh, unbroken DNA chand, uh, strand. 
So we're talking about leading and lagging strands. Let's get into this a little bit more. Imagine that the direction of our replication is moving this way. So helicase is here unwinding our double-stranded DNA into single-stranded DNA. So remember, DNA is always synthesized in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. That means that DNA is getting synthesized this way, from 5' prime to 3' prime. So DNA polymerase needs a free 3' prime hydroxyl group to add the next nucleotide to. And on the lagging strand, which is moving 3' prime to 5', prime, our daughter strand can just be synthesized 5' prime to 3'. Prime because as helicase opens up more DNA, that DNA is going to be showing us this free 3' prime hydroxyl group down here. However, in the other direction, the lagging strand, as DNA helicase keeps unwinding and you unwind this DNA, what we see is the 5' prime ends of the molecules being exposed. So we are exposing this part of the DNA molecule. Remember, we synthesize 5' prime to 3'. Prime. We need that free 3' prime hydroxyl. So we're not actually uncovering that on the lagging strand. So DNA polymerase actually needs to pl uh, polymerize the opposite direction on the lagging strand. It has to go this way, which would be no problem, except to remember, this DNA down here is still double-stranded. It hasn't been unwound yet. So our DNA polymerase does not have access to this free 3' prime hydroxyl. It has to wait until the DNA is open to get access to those. So what happens is we have discontinuous polymerization on our lagging strand in that DNA polymerase starts polymerizing in little chunks called Okazaki fragments from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. As more DNA is unwound, it will go from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And then we'll have little nicks in here that DNA ligase will come in and fix for us in the end. So it's important, if I give you a replication fork movement, and two strands of DNA. You should be able to identify which is the leading strand and which is the lagging strand. You should also be able to tell me why DNA on the lagging strand needs to be synthesized in fragments in the opposite direction that the leading strand DNA is synthesized. And remember, the reason for that is because we don't have access to that free 3' prime hydroxyl end that we need to synthesize in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction on the lagging strand. And we do have access to that hydroxyl group, that 3' prime hydroxyl on the leading strand. So sometimes DNA replication makes mistakes. And it makes a mistake in replication about one in every 100,000 nucleotides that we add. And that really doesn't sound like a big deal, except we're adding six billion nucleotides for every cell every time a cell is divided. That means we would have 120,000 errors in each new cell that we're making. And that's a lot of errors, and that would introduce a lot of mutations. So we have something called DNA repair. We have repair mechanisms that are going to fix these occasional errors in replication. The first type of DNA uh, repair is called mismatch repair. You can see here DNA is being split in half and daughter strands are being synthesized. However, we have an error here. Here you see a G bound to a T, and we know that a G should be bound to a C. That is a mismatch. So in mismatch repair, we have an incorrect uh, base added, and that's detected by the cell. And then the mismatch repair proteins, which are a set of proteins, they come in and remove this uh, problem mismatch base and replace it with the correct base. And that leads us to what we should have down here, which is a G bound to a C. Uh, one of the other main types of DNA is called thymine dimer repair. So this is repaired by a process called nucleotide excision. Excision is the taking out of something. So sometimes when you have DNA exposed to UV light, 
uh, such as the DNA in the cells in your skin when you walk outside and the sunlight shines on you, you'll have some UV light hitting your skin. And that can cause two thymines that are next to each other to bind to each other. That's called a thymine dimer. So in normal cells, we have excision repair that comes in, takes out that thymine dimer, and replaces it with two thymines that are not bound to each other. However, some people have a problem with uh, nucleotide excision repair, and they get this thing called xeroderma pigmentosa. Let's see a picture of that here in figure 4.2. This person has that condition in which thymine dimerization goes unrepaired. So when they go outside in the sunlight and they receive UV rays, they get these thymine dimers in their DNA, but the nucleotide excision does not repair these. So they get these skin lesions wherein the cells that are being exposed to DNA have incorrectly uh, replicated uh, thymine dimers in their DNA and that causes this uh, rather serious condition on their skin. So this figure will make more sense after our next lecture on DNA translation into RNA and transcription into proteins. But remember we said that our central dogma is DNA to RNA to protein. And protein our uh, proteins are the kind of movers and shakers and doers inside our bodies. So if you have a problem with your DNA replication, remember DNA is the code for proteins, then you're going to have a problem with the proteins that you eventually make, and this is called a mutation. However, some mutations are silent. Sometimes they have no effect because, as we'll learn in further lectures, there are multiple three-code DNA sequences that code for the same protein. So here you can see in this silent mutation, we have a amino acid called valine, V-A-L. That's coded by this sequence of DNA, which is G-T-A. If we get it a mutation in, that goes unrepaired, we might have a GTT. Well, it turns out that GTT also codes, codes for valine. So our final protein product, serine, valine, proline, tyrosine, will be the same as it was before the mutation. Another kind of mutation is called a missense mutation. This results in the substitution of an amino acid. Here you can see that this CCT group of DNA molecule or nucleotides codes for the protein proline. However, if we have a mutation that C becomes an A, we now are coding for the protein threonine. That's called a missense mutation. So instead of proline, which we should have, we get a threonine. That can change how that protein behaves. The other type of mutation is a nonsense mutation. This substitutes a stop codon for an amino acid. A stop codon is a special type of codon that tells the ribosome, which is the group of proteins that synthesize um, our proteins, to stop acting. So here we see tyrosine coded with TAC, but we have a mutation that went unrepaired, replaced this C with a G. That's actually a stop codon. So here the protein would be made halfway, then the ribosome would see this stop codon and it would stop making the protein. So we essentially have half a protein. That would be a non-functional protein. And finally, we have frame shift mutations. This is a group of mutations where we have an insertion or a deletion of a nucleotide, and that can result in an actual whole shift in the frame of our ribosome reading. Here we have the insertion of a TNA. So you'll see this results in serine, valine, and instead of a proline and tyrosine, we're actually are starting to code for two leucines. This is going to mess up the rest of the protein because of that insertion of two um, nucleotides. So again, we, all ha we have these types of mutations, and a mutation in a DNA molecule can lead to a change in a protein molecule. And that's because of the central dogma of molecular biology, which says that DNA 
codes for RNA, which then makes protein. So changes in DNA change the way proteins are made, and that in turn changes the way the proteins can function. So that's all for DNA replication and repair. In our next module, we'll talk about the process of DNA being transcribed into RNA and translated into proteins. Thank you for watching.